Good morning. Welcome to Portland Bible Church. <clears throat> I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and we're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. Thank you so much for joining with us this morning. Those who are here in person, those who are live streaming on Judy Glennie's Facebook page, you can also check it out at portlandbiblechurch.com. Uh, we have a link there to YouTube so you can check out our services. We have over 400 services now available on video as well as many on audio. We also have probably nearly 100 studies of different aspects of the scripture, categorical developments of various biblical subjects. So it's all available to you at the website. You can check that out. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our congregation. Remember, our services are on Sunday morning, right now, 10 o'clock, and again at 11.15. And after our second service, we have some time where we sing the great hymns of the church. So if you're in the Portland, Vancouver area, uh, drop by, join with us, so we can fellowship and uh, singing the great hymns of the church. On Thursday, we have class at 7 o'clock. And uh, <clears throat> on Thursday, we're studying the epistle to the Ephesians. Right now, we're looking at prayer very important, one of the great essentials of the Christian way of life, uh, the concept of communicating with God our desires and all those things that we uh, are requesting for ourselves and for others. So that's on Thursday and on Wednesday at two o'clock right here in our house. My wife Judy has a class for the ladies and right now they're studying prophecy. And so uh, you can get in on that if you so desire. So those are our classes. And as we say, we're basically uh, studying the Word of God, the whole Word of God. And we look at every verse, every time, all the time. And so we appreciate you being with us. And one of the things I wanted to mention this morning, if I haven't recently, is this book by uh, Patrick Wyatt. Some of you have already obtained a copy of this. And uh, I'm trying to get some more of these. We do have a few. So if you'd like one and you haven't received one yet, uh, free postpaid on the grace basis. This is Darkened Pulpits. It's one of the greatest presentations of the difficulty that we face today, not just in the world at large, but within the church itself, the attack on the word of God and the clarity of the presentation of the gospel and all of the other things in terms of social justice and all those things that have come against Christ over the centuries seem to be coming to fruition once again in the local churches. Many times we see the problems that Israel had, and yet today the church has fallen into the same type of legalism, the same type of apostasy as Israel did before the fall of that nation in 70 AD. And so sadly the church has gone full circle and is behaving much the same as Israel did before their uh, fall at that time. So uh, it's really important to see where we're at, to pray for our nation in particular, to pray for the leaders of our nation so that we might continue in freedom, but especially to pray for the pastors and the local churches that they might continue to do the job that God has intended for them to teach his word without apology uh, and to the best of their ability under the filling of the Spirit, exactly what God intended, and to clearly give the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, one of the other things that I wanted to mention, we've been mentioning, of course, is the Rosenberg Report on TBN. Again, every time I view it, it's just incredible. He just has uh, a great way of presenting uh, not only the gospel clearly, which he does always, but uh, the news of the day, the things that pertain to the United States, everything that pertains to Israel and the surrounding nations. And so uh, he has kind of the pulse of what's going on more than any of the other news outlets that I know of. It's probably the best news that's available to you. It's on TBN on a Thursday night. And of course, it's available at his website as well, Joel Rosenberg. All right, uh, just uh, something that is really important for us uh, in the area of national activities and events. All right, so uh, it's always our custom at the beginning of each of our Bible studies to take some time for silent prayer. This gives us the opportunity to acknowledge any sins that we're aware of. We believe this is essential moment by moment, but especially before we study God's word, so that we're enabled or filled with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, according to John, in his first epistle, he said, if we, that is believers, confess our sins, 
moment by moment, acknowledge them, uh, confess them, name them to God, that they are what God would consider sin. He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins based on the work of Christ on the cross and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe this picks up the ones we forgot about or didn't know that we had committed. And so in preparation for our study this morning, take some time for silent prayer to acknowledge any sins that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us. With that in mind, let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have been indeed uh, uh, blessing us with freedom in this nation, lo, these many years. We pray that that would continue. We thank you that you've allowed us to have time to study your word in the way that you instruct us in that word. We pray that as we study this morning, you would enable us, encourage, challenge, and motivate us by the things that we study. And we pray it all in the mighty and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He he gives me the ways of righteousness and the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Open the word this morning to the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 28. Hebrews 11, 28. We've been studying in the book of Hebrews for some time, and in this chapter 11 for also a rather lengthy period of time. The reason being, what we find here is a catalog of the Old Testament saints and their great faith and their exercise of that faith in the things that they did and were called to do by God. We examined, for example, about seven uh, seven uh, uh, lines of dealing with Moses. Of course, that encompasses the entire Pentateuch of the Old Testament uh, in seven verses. So obviously, it's simply a review and assumes uh, the writer's the writer of Hebrews assuming that the Hebrew people would recognize, since they had accepted many of them, the Messiah, these things and understand them. But for those of us who are not of the Hebrew line and are Gentiles, these things may not be coming readily to mind. So we've taken some time uh, from our study and going back to the Old Testament and kind of highlighting some of the verses that the writer of Hebrews is pertaining to. Then, of course, we had Abraham as well. Uh, some verses that pertain to him. And so all of these, starting with uh, the uh, Genesis story and all the way up through Moses, where we are now. And in verse 28, uh, we see the, if you have your outline, you can see we're in the evidence of faith section. And so if you have your Bibles and open to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 28, we see that every verse or every uh, sentence, if you will, Every sentence begins with the word by faith or by means of faith, the instrumentality of a believer to exercise belief in the things of God and the word of God. And so we see here in this particular verse, he says, by faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the so that he who destroyed the firstborn might not touch them. We were kind of midstream there, and we uh, spent some time in this particular section looking at, of course, the Passover. And if you were with us last week, we kept the Passover. And Paul said that we should keep the Passover in his epistle to the Corinthians, noting that this is important because Jesus took the Passover as the occasion to salute and to, of course, ratify the new covenant to Israel, spoken by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, 31, many centuries earlier. And so as he took those elements of communion, he said to do this. And he was teaching the disciples and by application to all of us 
through all generations of the church age to take these elements in commemoration of the person, the undiminished deity of the true humanity of Jesus Christ, and his work, his death on the cross, for all sins, for all people, once and for all. So this is the Passover, and we noted that last time in this particular verse. And then, of course, it says uh, here, the sprinkling of blood, and I didn't cover too much there, but I was going back, and I wanted to take a quick look at the blood. We talk about the blood, and there are all kinds of passages that deal with the blood. We have the entire uh, Old Testament Levitical system, with the sacrifices of all the animals, and the blood being uh, carried by the high priest into the mercy seat once a year on the Day of Atonement, and in the meantime, sprinkling the articles of furniture, sprinkling uh, the actual tabernacle itself, sprinkling, of course, the priests who would be giving and uh, officiating in the sacrificial system. And so this blood, and we mentioned even last week that there was a special picture, uh, a container holding the blood, with, uh, sorry, not holding, holding the wine that was placed on the table of showbread. And this itself uh, was poured over uh, every offering that was made, uh, called the drink offering. So it, of course, represented the blood, even as Jesus Christ, when he took the cup, which was that wine, and said, this is, uh, the, this is the blood of the new covenant, uh, and this is being poured out for you, and this referenced Jesus Christ. So blood is significant, and so as I was thinking about that, I thought, well, what, what is blood? What does blood do? <laughs> so I called on my wife, who has studied uh, anatomy and physiology. By the way, I was a mechanical engineer, and my courses were difficult, but uh, those who took uh, phys ed, they had some difficult courses too. They didn't just play tennis and volleyball. They had something called anatomy and physiology. And that textbook is as difficult as any text I had in uh, mechanical engineering. So I asked her uh, about what she knew about the blood. And she said, well, that was a long time ago and a difficult study. So last night we were researching and I said, well, give me the bottom line on blood. And so uh, I'm going to give you the, the uh, thumbnail sketch of blood and why it is significant and why God chose this particular thing, this blood, uh, as a picture of Christ's death on the cross and the animal sacrifices that earlier prefigured that. And so basically we know that blood is red and basically sometimes scarlet, uh, and that's because it has been oxygenated in the lungs. And so the blood goes through the lungs and it makes a circular path through just about every part of the body and down to the smallest capillaries that carry blood to every part of the body and then carry back the, uh, uh, the things that have the toxins from every part of the body. Now, there are many other things that are involved. We have the kidneys, of course, which process out uh, the junk, uh, the toxins, and also the liver. But basically, the lungs and the blood uh, that uh, go through the lungs are doing the work. In fact, the uh, definition says blood is the transport system in the body. Everything depends on the blood. If we lose all of our blood, that's it, game over. So the blood, of course, <laughs> obviously red, and it gets oxygenated. It picks up oxygen from in the lungs and then passes through the arteries all through the body parts. Uh, and of course, uh, we see also that then it becomes... Uh, uh, becomes bluish, bluish red when it has been when it has given up that oxygen to nourish the tissues of the body, and it returns to the lungs through the tiny vessels called capillaries, and they're between the arteries and the veins. Basically, the arteries are the ones that go out from the heart, and the veins come back, and so that's basically the circulation in a nutshell. And then finally, it says here, uh, in the lungs, the blood gives up the carbon dioxide waste. It is taken from the tissues, receiving a new supply of oxygen, and it begins a new cycle. And so <laughs> that's the layman's way. I think they have a whole chapter on how that happens, all the different facets of blood and so forth, but just the basic idea. And that's what I was looking for. And my point of looking for that was the fact that we use blood or I should say Moses was instructed to use the animal blood and to sprinkle. So in that sense, blood purifies. 
Now, it doesn't mean that it actually literally purified the table of showbread and the tabernacle tent itself or even the priest, but it's symbolic of cleansing. Why? Because the blood takes the oxygen to every part of the body and cleanses it. And then it picks up and detoxifies the body and picks up and goes back into the lungs and gets rid of it and we exhale it. Of course, it also goes through the kidneys, goes through uh, various other aspects of cleansing, but that's the basic idea. So blood has a purifying and a cleansing process to the body. And of course, if your heart doesn't work too good or your lungs don't work too good, your body remains toxic. And that reminded me of the old sin nature. If we continue in sin, our, our soul and our person becomes toxic, and we need to have a cleansing. And the cleansing, of course, is a spiritual cleansing that the body uh, or that the, the Bible speaks of. And so when we believe in Jesus Christ, we have a permanent cleansing of the Holy Spirit, but then we need to continue to cleanse, and this is where we get into confession of sin periodically. It's kind of like the cycle that we pick up toxins, and we pick them up from society around us, the world, the, the devil, and even our own old sin nature. So we need to expel those toxins, that is, through the intake of the Word of God. And so there are many other parts that are metaphoric with regard to the blood, but basically if you think of it as the thing that is cleansing, and that's why the blood was sprinkled on various things, including the mercy seat. Now, it didn't do anything literally to the mercy seat other than stain it with blood, but it represented the fact that the blood covered over the sinful nature of Israel contained by the articles inside of the Ark of the Covenant, which were the bud, the rod of Aaron that budded because they rejected God's authority. The pot of manna because they wanted more than just manna in the wilderness. And of course, we have all of these things, including these tables of stone that were in there that were the Ten Commandments, all of which they had broken. And the blood sprinkle on the mercy seat represented that they were cleansed by this blood. And the blood, of course, looked forward to the ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. So blood has basically a twofold uh, purpose. One is to process and give cleansing to the body. The other is to remove the toxins from the body. And when it says that the blood of Christ cleanses us, that is exactly what it does. It purifies us by removing the sin and giving us basically a new supply, as it were, spiritually, of oxygenated blood. So just kind of a fascinating thing as I was thinking about that, you know, because I always thought, well, you're not, uh, the scripture is clear. It says we're not to drink blood. And I thought, well, if it's so healthy and cleansing, why wouldn't we drink it? Well, because there's also toxins in that blood after it goes through and cleans out the toxins from the body. So it becomes toxic if we would drink blood uh, after we have taken it out of the body. So there are many things, and I'm still researching this, but I thought it was kind of interesting, the twofold aspect here uh, of the blood. And so basically, one, it supplies oxygen to the cells of the body and cleanses the body, and two, it carries away the toxins and the carbon dioxide, which we expel uh, out of the body and the other means of expelling toxins from the body. So there's the blood. And again, the sprinkling, we noted that the word sprinkling occurs here in this passage. Uh, and so the writer of Hebrews notes this idea of all the sprinkling, many, many passages that describe the sprinkling in the Old Testament. But it's also found, as we noted last time, in several places in the book of Hebrews. In fact, we have uh, uh, the specific word that's used here has to do with kind of a pouring rather than just a sprinkling. Uh, but uh, there are many other uses of another word, and they start over in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, 13. I wanted to go through those. We talked about them last time, but I wanted to look at them specifically. So go over to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13. And here it says, If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer, that was the red heifer, sprinkling those, sprinkling those people, those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to give 
uh, to uh, to serve the living God. I was trying to think of what might be parallel to the lungs. We know the heart, of course, is the pump that, that moves and transports the blood, but what would be the lungs in terms of the spiritual understanding? The best I can understand is the conscience, because thoughts come into the conscience, and if we have a seared conscience from the old sin nature, then we have toxins that go to the brain and subsequently to the soul. However, if we are born again, we revise and revitalize and replace our conscience with new norms and standards. Therefore, when input comes into our mind through the conscience, the conscience says, wait a minute, that's not a good thing, and it rejects it, kind of like the lungs uh, taking out the toxins and expelling them like carbon dioxide. Now, I don't know if we can make an exact parallel, but it seems that the conscience spoken of in the New Testament called the sunadesis, which compares information, uh, com information which comes in with the understanding spiritually that you have, and then transfers that to the soul or the brain soul where you can make a decision for or against that information. So there may be more there, and I'd have to talk to a, a, a Christian cardiologist and see if I'm correct, but it is an interesting concept because blood is everywhere in Scripture. And you know your pastor. I can't just take the word blood and throw it around like so many people do. I want to know, well, so what's the point? It is obviously a metaphor, just like the fact that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That refers to the mentality of the soul. Your heart is not wicked unless you become uh, toxic in the heart and have a heart attack. Then I guess it would be wicked, but it's speaking metaphorically. So the word heart refers to the mentality of the soul. Uh, even the word in the Old Testament for the kidneys, kiliot, refers to the emotions. So many parts of the body are used in Scripture to refer to, uh, um, to uh, spiritual significance. And I believe this, of course, this blood has great spiritual significance because the very work of Christ on the cross is described as having shed his blood. Well, I thought that was interesting. So we have this one. Then we can go over to Hebrews 9, 19. Just a little further down, it says, For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to the people, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Now, I don't know if he went through and sprinkled every one of the million people or however many there were, but basically ceremonially sprinkling the, pe sprinkling the people with the blood. And so the writer of Hebrews emphasizes it these multiple times. We see here over five times that he uses this idea of sprinkling. And then later on, after our chapter, 1128, we go to chapter uh, 13, 9 the end. So he's not finished when he gets to chapter 13. And we'll restate this when we get there. But in chapter 13 and verse 9, he says this, do not carry away by, do not be carried away by various strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by food. Let's see, that doesn't, did I get the wrong verse there? Is it 11? I guess it's 11 there. Uh, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest is an offering for sin. They are burned outside the camp. So here we have the blood mentioned again in uh, Hebrews 13, 11. And then I believe also 21, a little bit further down. Let's see if it's there. Uh, I guess it isn't there. I thought it was there. 20, 21. Yeah, no. Is it 921? See, I get, did I do 919? Let's Probably see. 20. Okay, 919. I guess that was what I didn't do. Yeah, okay. All right. As you were, I saw I, I saw the last letter of Hebrews looked like a 13. Can't read my own writing. All right. So Hebrews then 9, 19. That's the next one. Uh, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people, I uh, did do that one, and then he sprinkled that. And then verse 21, a little bit further down. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. So all the vessels, what would that be? All of the uh, the uh, 
uh, the table of showbread and then all the things it contained, <laughs> like the, the uh, uh, vase or whatever it was that contained the, the uh, wine, uh, all of the uh, uh, artifacts in there, the candelabra and so forth, all of those containers, all of those features were sprinkled, as well as the tabernacle. So he mentions all of these things. And then in chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 22, we saw it in chapter 10. Here he says, uh, let us draw near with the genuine or sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts, as it were, sprinkled. They've added the word clean, but the idea, of course, is the sprinkling cleanses of blood from all from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Here you see the word conscience in the Greek sunadesis. Soon means with, ido, for, for idesis means knowledge together with. So the conscience takes information that comes into our brain and decides whether it's worth keeping and acting upon or rejecting. Kind of like the, the uh, lungs is how I see it. The lungs take and they put the oxygen in the blood, send it off, and of course it goes to the heart and to all the rest of the body. And at the same time, it takes the blood that's going back and takes all the uh, toxins out and it is expired as carbon dioxide. So obviously the uh, conscience seems to be similar uh, in terms of its meaning to what we would consider physically the lungs. Okay, so that's that one. And then in chapter 12, we have, of course, chapter 11, 28. In chapter 12, 24. Chapter 12, verse 24. And so here it says, we have Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And, of course, in the uh, chapter that we're looking at, chapter 11, he started with Abel, and his offering of a sacrifice after uh, uh, during that initial uh, activity in chapter in, in the chapters in Genesis. So we have that, and then one more time over in First Peter. By the way, we consider First Peter to be a Hebrew epistle. We have noted we have First uh, and Second Peter. We have the book of Hebrews. We have James. We have Jude. Uh, all of these are considered to be Hebrew epistles, meaning they were written to the Jewish people who had believed in the Messiah. And so in 1 Peter, in chapter 1 and verse 2, we read this. I'll start with verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are aliens, that is, aliens in the sense that they were basically kicked out of Israel, and they're aliens, they're, they're in many places, in Pontius, Galatia, of course, a great population of Hebrew Christians in Galatia, and of course, Paul writes to them in the epistle to the Galatians, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, uh, who are chosen, this, of course, are the believers who have accepted Messiah, and they are accepted that according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ, and here it is, be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Now again, I can't remember ever being physically sprinkled with blood, but day by day and moment by moment as a believer, metaphorically, we have the sprinkling, as it were, of blood which continually purifies us. The blood of Christ does it once and for all, but we are purified day by day as we acknowledge any sins. We confess those sins. We expel those sins, confess them to the Father, and we inhale then the fresh supply of oxygen, the forgiveness of sins. So there's some beautiful parallels here. I'm not finished with this by a long shot, but at this point, that's about all that I have, and it is kind of interesting. I was just thinking about and praying about this last night. So by faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood and all the significance so that the destroyer, the destroying, the, the one destroying the firstborn would not touch them. Now, again, this destroying, I wanted to decide people talk about the, the destroying angel. And so I made the connection that the destroying angel is none other than a pre-incarnate appearance 
and activity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have time to develop it. You can go to the website and you can look up the doctrine of the angel of Jehovah. In the Old Testament, the angel of Jehovah or the angel of God is none other than the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. He was, of course, uh, in the burning bush that spoke to Moses. He was at the top of the dais uh, of the Shekinah glory in Ezekiel chapter 1 and following. And of course, we see that the Shekinah glory visited Israel and actually led them through the wilderness. By day, it was a pillar of, uh, of cloud, and by night, a pillar of fire. And Jesus was involved uh, personally in that activity. So many times through the Old Testament, when it says God was involved, when Jacob wrestled with God, it was the second member of the Trinity, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate appearance. And so this destroying angel, I believe, was also the Lord Jesus Christ. It was no other than the second member of the Trinity. So it talks about the one who destroys, the destroying angel. And so we go over to Exodus chapter 12. Again, we need to refer to the Old Testament because the writer of Hebrews uh, totally understands the Old Testament and uses it, obviously, for uh, teaching purposes. And so in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 23, Exodus chapter 12, 23. Now it says here, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. Now the word Lord in the Hebrew is actually what we call the tetragrammaton. That's the four letters, Y, H, W, or V, H, in the Hebrew. These, of course, uh, were uh, the shortened form of what God told Moses was his name. Moses said, well, what, what's your name so that I can tell him who has sent me? And God said, I am who I am. The I am is Jesus Christ. He said before Abraham was, I am. So the revealed member of the Godhead is none other than Jesus Christ. We know him as that from the New Testament. The Old Testament, the revelation of the second member of the Trinity, was known as the angel of Jehovah or the angel of God or just the Lord. So it doesn't talk about an angel here. It says the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel uh, and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come in to your homes to smite you. So the question is, well, we got the Lord. Is that God the Father or is that the destroyer? So it seems that they're really one and the same. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. This, of course, is the Passover, the very literal Passover. Now, the celebration was the feast that they had before the death angel came. The question is, is the death angel one and the same with the Lord? Is it speaking here of the Lord as God the Father and the destroyer as God the Son? That's the difficulty. Sometimes the word, the tetragrammaton, Jehovah, as we pronounce it, refers to the Father. Sometimes it refers to the Son. And sometimes it refers to the Holy Spirit. So here it could certainly refer to the Father and the destroyer referring to the revealed member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, as the destroyer. And so we see uh, in this passage, 29, uh, let's see, Exodus 12, 29, go down to 29. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord, there's the Tetragrammaton, struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh, uh, who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle, cattle. And so he continues to present this whole idea of the destroying of the firstborn. And so we see the angel of Jehovah mentioned many times. I don't have time to develop all of the passages, but just a couple of them. I wanted to look at uh, uh, a few times where the angel of the Lord seems to be the revealed member of the Trinity as we know him, Jesus Christ. It's not his name in the Old Testament, but uh, it would be this tetragrammaton if the context determined it referred to him, the second member of the Trinity, rather than the first member of the Trinity, God the Father. Turn over to Second Kings. Second Kings. In Second Kings chapter 19, here we have another destruction, and this destruction is of the Assyrian army under Sennacherib in Second Kings chapter 19, 35. 
I always remember this because of what it says uh, in the Hebrew. And so in 2 Kings 19.35, we see a passage that talks about when Sennacherib came from the Assyrians down, he had pre previously uh, destroyed the northern kingdom and carried them off. And now he was attacking Jerusalem. And of course, the Lord was going to deliver Jerusalem and the southern kingdom for another period of time from 721 down to 586 BC if you're familiar and it says here in verse 34 I will defend this city to save it for my own sake not because they're doing great things but I'm delivering them for my sake and for my servant David's sake so because it was David and because of God's desire and his uh divine decrees to deliver the city at this time then it happened that night that the angel of the lord now i can show you and if you go to the website and look up the doctrine of the angel of jehovah you'll see that in all the places where the angel of jehovah is listed he is also called lord and therefore uh, an angel is not god and yet the angel of jehovah is called the lord in a number of places and so the angel of the lord went out and he struck 185,000, the Assyrian infantry, in the camp. Uh, and uh, the, when the men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead bodies. That's kind of uh, in the Hebrew, it says they, they fell out for morning formation. If any of you were in the military, you know, usually in the morning, uh, in the company, you would fall out uh, before your uh, barracks uh, in company formation to be assigned the work for the day and you would come to attention and you would listen to the instructions of the commander and then you would go to do whatever it was. And so they fell out <laughs> and they fell down. They fell out for formation and they were all standing there and they were all dead. And so it's just the way it's said. 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When they arose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead bodies. And it's just, uh, just like that. So Jesus Christ killed 185,000 infantry at that time to deliver the southern kingdom and Jerusalem from the Assyrians, from Sennacherib. And so from verse 32 down through 37, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived in Nineveh. That, of course, has uh, great ramifications. We don't have time to develop it. Nimrod, of course, created Nineveh uh, uh, not shortly after the flood. And this, of course, is the same fella who created the ill-fated Tower of Babel. Verse 37, and it came about as he was worshiping in the house of uh, Nishrash, his god, that uh, Adam Klish. And another fellow there uh, killed him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And uh, Ezra Haddon, the son, became king in his place. So obviously he didn't die uh, with the 185,000. He went home and was killed by people in his own party, as it were, at home when he was worshiping. So we have that one. And then just to round this out, at the second advent, at the second advent in Revelation 19, another time where we see the Lord, in this case, not the angel of the Lord, but Jesus Christ himself. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, almost at the end of your Bible. Revelation chapter 19. 11, all the way down through 21, we'll just read a few verses. In 11, it says, I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This, of course, is Jesus Christ at the second advent, waging war over Antichrist during that future tribulation and winning the victory. And it says here, uh, on the white horse, uh, and uh, in righteousness he judges and wages war and his eyes are a flame of fire and so on his name is the name no one knows except him and he is clothed with a robe verse 13 dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God so we know who this is it's the Lord Jesus Christ winning the victory at uh, the time of the destruction of Antichrist and of course those that are following uh, on white horses 
that's us, great time uh, there in verse 14. And uh, then he says in verse 15, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he might smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and treads the winepress of his fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So we have that and he kills the army and going all the way down, uh, we see that the uh, uh, the one who deceived, the mark of the beast, they were of course also destroyed in verse 20, 21 says, and the rest were killed with the sword which comes from the mouth of him who sat upon the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. This is a reference to the tribulation time when Jesus Christ defeats the Antichrist, ushering the millennium. And the millennium is described as we begin chapter 20. There it says that Satan, that old dragon, uh, 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 was uh, locked up for a thousand years. And then, of course, we have the millennium. So this is right before the beginning of the thousand-year millennial reign when Jesus Christ wins the victory over Antichrist. And, of course, we see there that uh, uh, a great percentage of the world's population, way more than 185,000 Assyrian. So Jesus Christ is the one who actually wages war. I believe he did it with Sennacherib as the angel of Jehovah. Uh, I believe he was the one who destroyed the firstborn of the, of the, of the Egyptians and uh, Pharaoh as well. So obviously more could be said, but I thought that that was something that was interesting because we always wonder, who was that death angel? Well, that death angel was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate appearance as the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, here called the destroyer. And at the end of the millennium, we see a similar thing once again. We can go to that as we close here. Take a look at Revelation chapter 20. And this is 7 through 15. Again, we won't read all of it. In Revelation 20, 7 says here, And when the thousand years were complete, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. Believe it or not, in perfect environment, nations will still rise up against God and his, and his son, Jesus Christ, who is reigning. And so it says here, he will be released from prison and will come out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore, the greatest kill ever by the Lord Jesus Christ of the enemy. And they shall come up on the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the believers, the saints, and the beloved city. That would be Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom. And fire came down from heaven to devour them. And of course, the devil was thrown into the lake of fire. And then we have the great white throne judgment. And so people don't like to talk about the wrath of God. But Jesus Christ is the greatest killer of the enemies of God all time. And he will supersede that uh, tremendous number of dead during the beginning of the millennium at the destruction of Antichrist and his armies. And finally, as he simply brings down fire from heaven to wipe out the enemies. Well, it says that the death angels should not touch them. And so I think last time we mentioned, and I don't have the time really, I don't believe, what's our time? Seven. Oh, we got time? Okay. We have uh, this word could not touch them. We see in Colossians chapter 2, 21. Colossians 2, 21. We got this far, but I we went very quickly, so I wanted to go back and pick this up. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 21. Here we talk about the legalism. And uh, in the time of Moses, certain things were not to be handled. And he says here, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And of course, now it says, if you've died with Christ to the elemental principles of the world, why are you living in the world and submitting to decrees such as do not touch, do not taste, uh, and, uh, and do not handle? Because this was required under the Mosaic law. Today, we do not have that law. We are under a higher law known as the law of Christ. So the law of Moses stated, for example, we could not, they could not touch the holy mountain. 
Uh, they could not touch dead bodies for a period of time. So there were many things that were forbidden. They could not eat certain foods. None of those restrictions apply to us. They were under the law of Moses, not touching. Under the law of Christ, obviously, to say, you shall not do this, you shall not touch things, you shall not eat certain things, becomes legalism. Because we are not under the law of Moses, but under the law of Christ. In our passage in Hebrews 11.28, it uh, sim simply says, as we have noted over there, let's go back over there, Hebrews 11 and 28, uh, it says here that uh, the death angel, the Lord Jesus Christ, would not touch the believers because of the blood on the lintel and the doorposts. However, we see in, Revela or in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 20, we'll be having some time when we get there, in verse 20, it says, back in the day, this refers back to the time of Moses. For they, that is the Hebrews, <clears throat> pardon me, under the Mosaic covenant, could not bear the command of God. He gave the Ten Commandments verbally to Israel and scared him half to death. And they told Moses, don't let him talk to us anymore. You go talk to him and come back and tell us about it. We don't want to hear it. They were scared because this voice sounded like a volcano and uh, it was giving the commandments. At any rate, it says... If, uh, if ever a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. And so uh, this was a reference back to what we talked about uh, in the law of Moses in Colossians 2.21 and all of those things in the Levitical system. So holiness of God in the Old Testament was not to touch his mountain. This is a reference to Mount Sinai, and this, of course, we find in Hebrews 12, 18, all the way down through 24, and we'll do that a little bit later. Well, I think we finally finished <laughs> this verse. I wanted to spend a little time, as I said, looking at the blood. I hope that was helpful. I'm sure I haven't come to the end of the picture that the blood represents, but obviously the blood of Jesus Christ saves us. His death on the cross is the issue. And for that person who may be here this morning, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know God had you in mind. When Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, came into human history, the only begotten that is only born of a woman uh, in human history, who was the Savior as well as undiminished deity, true and pure humanity, sinless humanity. He went to the cross and bore my sin and your sin, everyone's sin, once and for all time, once and for all sins. And you can have eternal life, or as we call it, everlasting life, uh, if you believe in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely called son, his Messiah, Mashiach, the one who was sent, his only born son, that whoever, anybody, Whoever would believe in him would not perish, that is eternal damnation, but have everlasting life. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The scripture is quite clear. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you again for another opportunity to study your word. We pray that we have clarified some things in our own mind with regard to the sprinkling of the blood and all that are represented in terms of the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, bearing all of our sins. We thank you for these things, Father. We pray that you would enable us to understand these passages that relate back to the Mosaic Covenant and how they are fulfilled totally in the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all these things, and we pray it now in the powerful name of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.